This is Join Us in France, episode 315. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and today I bring you a conversation with Elise about her visit to Gaillac wine country. As you may know, Gaillac is in Occitanie, between Toulouse and Albi, and we're working hard to convince you to come visit us in the southwest of France. <laughs> Elise is amazing at finding some great drives you can take from Toulouse and she tells us all about the history of this area and the wines as well. They're not as well known in the US, but they are very nice. Thank you, patrons, for giving me a precious gift, the time to produce this podcast. By becoming a patron, you join the team of folks who love France and want to hear all about it, which makes me very happy. There will be a shout out to new patrons after the interview. A big thank you also to all of you who have purchased or will purchase my cookbook, Join Us at the Table, and my Paris tours, or make purchases through my Amazon affiliate links. You can see all of that on Join Us in France forward slash boutique. If you're still looking for gifts, my cookbook is now available through several vendors and print formats. You can choose the best one for you at joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique. Show notes for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com for slash 315. Everything goes to the website. That's the numeral 315, where you can see a recap of what we've discussed. And the best way to stay in touch with me and the podcast is to sign up for the newsletter. Again, on the website, joinusinfrance.com for slash newsletter. <laughs> Bonjour Elise. Bonjour Annie. We are t today, today on this very rainy day. Finally. <laughs> Finally, yes. We're complaining already, but we really need it. <laughs> we are going to talk about the uh, a beautiful visit to Gaillac wine country. Yes. Which you did recently with I your did very, husband. Very, very recently. Yes. Uh, this past weekend was uh, what uh, is called the Weekend de Patrimoine, which is a weekend uh, once a year, always in the middle of uh, September, where major things, uh, monuments, buildings, those that are usually open and those that are not usually open are open and available to the public for free. However, because of COVID, lots of things are kind of problematic. And um, so I thought, hmm, this might be a nice day to do something outside of the city in the countryside. And I had this urge to return to wine country, which uh, when you live in Toulouse means basically going to the Gaillac area. Or the Fronton area. Or the Fronton. The Fronton is, is closer actually than Gaillac, but it's much smaller as yeah. an area for producing wine. And the Gaillac area is really very, very beautiful. Yeah. So Now I have, to, I have to tell you that this episode isn't going to air for probably two months. So by then, just remember that the middle of September, every year in France, we have the Weekend du Patrimoine. It's wonderful. Last year I was in Paris. It's amazing it's in amazing. Paris, all the stuff you can do. Yep. Once this COVID thing is over, it's going to be fantastic again. Yes. But if you if you love to get into interesting buildings that are unusually, uh, that are not usually open to the public, right. This is the time to be in France. This is the time to be in France. And September is a wonderful month in general to yeah. be in France. Yeah, yeah. So we did uh, basically an excursion and we went to, uh, we visited two small towns. That One is the town of Rabastance, uh, which is an interesting name. And we <laughs> started basically there and ended at the uh, Bastide uh, called Lille sur -Tan. I'll mention a little bit about both of those after I talk about the wines. And in between... We did a section of uh, the wine road. There is a wine route in the region of Gaillac, but we just did a small part of it. We did what is basically technically called the left bank, not quite like in Paris, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's the southern part because all of this follows the Tarn River. So we were in the department of the Tarn, which is really between 30 and 60 kilometers from Toulouse. 
Right. Going so north. this is this is an excursion you can do from Toulouse fairly easily. Very, very easily. But you need a car. You definitely need a car. You can actually go to a couple of these towns by train. They're all on this very nice little train line that runs from uh, Toulouse to Gaillac, uh, which is the town that is basically the town that has the, gave the name to the wines and that actually continues up to Albi. But if you want to do a visit to the vineyards, unless you're doing a uh, bicycle, uh, or a motorcycle, uh, you definitely do need a car. Yeah. yeah. This is not something you can do. Uh, yeah, it'd be good to do on a bike. You could do it on a bike. It's not so far away. So, uh, it's not that far away. And the part that we did is actually the easier part to do by bike because it's not as hilly. It's mm. this, it's the lower part uh, of the uh, region that produces the wines. So uh, th- these are the Gayak wines. I don't know if we've talked about them before. The, the word is G-A-I-L-L-A-C. Gayak, uh, which is a, a name. Uh, lots of things in this area have uh, names that end in ak, A-C, which actually goes back to the uh, Gauls, the Celtic tribes, or as they were renamed by the Romans. And what's uh, fascinating about the Gayak wines, number one, I should say from the beginning, I love them. Okay. So uh, uh, I'm not a big fan of Bordeaux wines. Burgundy wines, I do love, but they are well out of my means, uh, most of the good ones. But Gaillac wines, which are relatively local, although now they're developing a very good reputation again after having had ups and downs in their history, are now starting to be sold in, uh, in other places, even outside of France. But they're wines that are uh, a little bit unusual because they have varieties of grapes that exist nowhere else. Mm. And they are, uh, I love them. I, so it's, it's really, you know, and the wine tasting is a, really a personal thing. It's totally subjective. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's just totally subjective. Um, who likes what? You know, you know it depends yeah. on what you like. That's all there is to it. You know? And drink what you like. And drink what you like. And don't worry about whether it's red, white, or rosé, whatever. You know, it yeah. doesn't, you know, do your thing, right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, be French. Do be, your thing. <laughs> do your thing, right? <laughs> Although, I don't know about when it comes to wines, if the French do their thing, yeah, more and more, they're they're kind of loosening up about, you know, don't do this. Yes, you can do this. Um, yeah. But anyway, so the, what's... I knew about some of the history of the Gaillac wines, but I went back and did some research uh, the other day just because I wanted to have very specific information to to fill in and and give some information about. Um, Technically, from a historical point of view, the Gaillac wines are the oldest wines in France. Hmm. It is, uh, according to major historians, including historians going back several centuries, the uh, region of Gaillac, which is basically north and slightly east of Toulouse, and which winds up being limestone and sandy, a lot of it. Uh, uh, the, the tribes that lived there were the Rutens, which were a, a Celtic tribe uh, before the Romans arrived. Uh, we all know that what happened once the Romans arrived is that we have this other civilization that became eventually all that we know today. But uh, apparently, even the Romans, to their great surprise, discovered that the local peoples were producing a a wine and they were using grapes that were really uh, indigenous or endemic. I'm not sure which is the right word for plants to this area. I see. And some of these varieties still exist. Some of them no longer exist. Uh Uh, But what is interesting is that at the beginning, uh, when the Romans first arrived, they, you know, they always traveled in their little backpacks. They had their little grapevines with the roots on them, besides whatever weapons they had, you know. They had to make sure they had their wine. Yeah. And uh, so what eventually happened, of course, is that after a certain amount of time, the Romans settled in all of this area, and they brought in a couple of varieties of grapes and mixed with these local grapes. But it's fascinating to know that wine was produced, this is going back to like maybe 50 AD, 100 AD, that there was a local wine, and this wine was used by the Romans as well as the local peoples. And basically, that wine stayed in existence and was written about until the fall of the Roman Empire. Mm. And the fall of the Roman Empire came at the time, you know, we go through this all the time. You have the Vandals, the Huns, the Vikings, eventually, all these different groups. So what happened was that once the Roman Empire fell. I like the expression, it fell. I'm not sure where it fell to, but it just basically disappeared. This area 
uh, was really ravaged. And uh, it's fascinating because this is typical of a lot of things that happened in France. So you go through a period of several hundred years where there is no longer any wine production whatsoever in this area. And then starting... I bet people still made wine for their own exactly. consumption. Yes, very, yes you're yeah, absolutely course, right. Yes, they did. But, but it was no longer a product of... Right. of uh, because the Romans you know, were really good at creating commercial routes, among other things. So it was a wine that started to be exported to other areas of Gaul. Uh -huh. And uh, what happens is that it's, it takes us through to basically the 800s, Well, you know, we have a period of several hundred years where everything is pretty much uh, non-existent in that sense. And then uh, with the establishment of abbeys and monasteries in lots of different places, one of the things that monasteries very often did, <clears throat> and this is the case in the area around Gaiac, which was a, an old Roman settlement that got to be rebuilt as an abbey, which is right on the Tarn River, is that they made wine, and very often they made wine uh, not just for their own use, but to sell so that they would have an income. Mm. And when they did start to make wine again, they picked up the varieties of grapes that had been in this area for a very long time, and they added a little bit of other new varieties. But what's so fascinating is that all through these centuries, this particular area, that is the Gaiac area, has some varieties of grapes that you will not find anywhere else. Mm. And they give the wines a very distinctive taste. Mm. And uh, uh, I, I'll talk about some of the names of the varieties afterwards because a couple of them are, are actually kind of fun. So what happened was that uh, starting then in the 800s and 900s, the reputation of the wines of this area, which were called the Gaiac wines, mm -hmm. uh, developed in all of what became the kingdom of France and the adjoining kingdoms. You know, we had, go through this a lot, but, you know, we have Aquitaine, you had the, the Dukes of Provence, you have the Counts of Toulouse. And the Counts of Toulouse, by the way, were some of the lords who were the seigneur, who were basically the feudal rulers of this area. The, the, the whole Gaillac area, for those people who've been to France and have been to Toulouse or been to Albi, basically this is an area that was pretty much divided in two between the Viscounts of Albi and the Counts of Toulouse, but they're all cousins anyway, so mm. it doesn't make much difference. And what happened was that the wines became so reputable that even the kings of England were asking for the Gaillac wines. <laughs> And the reason why this was possible, besides the fact that the reputation spread, was that the Tarn River, which is a very big and beautiful river, it flows into the Gironde at Bordeaux. Yeah. And it happens that from... Gaillac, where Gaillac is, and the two towns that I mentioned that are actually both on the Tarn River, you can take a boat, and uh, the flat-bottom boats called the Gabar, and you can go all the way to Bordeaux without any problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they were exporting the Gaillac wines. Huh. And, yeah, the uh, Gabar, it's interesting because it means fat boat. It means fat. It means fat. Ah, yeah, that's so, interesting. Because they are kind Squat. of... Yeah, they're They're wide. Right. They're wide boats. Right. Not very deep into the water at all. Right. But they're wide and steady. And they're wide and steady. And yeah. they were used for commerce up and down the rivers uh, for, for centuries and centuries. Yeah. Now, of course, you can take a tourist uh, ride yeah, on not, them. Yeah, no, They're kind of fun. <laughs> they're really nice. It's, it's a little better than a tourist train. It's, it's definitely much better than a tourist train. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but it's really fascinating because, number one, uh, that means that this area has been basically the most wine producing area historically of all of France mm. with maybe one exception. Nah, I'm not going to get into arguments with on, on, onologists about, you know, which is the <laughs> oldest wine in, in France, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, but it's definitely not Bordeaux. It's definitely more, if there's another area that can claim to be also the oldest winery area in France, it, it would be Northern Burgundy. So it would definitely ah, yes, not be Bordeaux. Yes, yes. But what happened was Once we get to the period of the war between the French and the English, mm -hmm. and the English take over the region around Bordeaux, now we're 
getting back to the old rivalry between the English and the French, and there's nothing we can do about it because I know we're friends now, but, you know, for a long time we were not friends at all. (laughs) Uh, What happened was that once the Dukes of Aquitaine became affiliated with the kings of England and they wanted to establish their power in the mainland of France, they started producing wines in what is now the Bordeaux area. Mm. And very clever and very nasty – they started taxing the Gaillac wines. Of course. Which had to come down the Tarn River into to the Garonne and from the Garonne go into the Gironde to be able to go out into the ocean and right. across dear old... <laughs> if you want to go anywhere, pay me taxes. Pay me taxes. Yeah. And so what happened was that there was a shift and the Gaillac wines started to be less important economically. Mm. And so, again, it became more of a local production. Mm. And this is something that continued actually through a couple of centuries. The last few centuries up till the revolution, you have this real competition and rivalry. And the Bordeaux wines became more and more important and more famous, like the the English call it claret, which is actually Bordeaux. And uh, the Gaillac wines fell into disrepute. Mm. But it is a fact that for a period of several hundred years, the French kings only wanted Gaillac wines. Mm. The Counts of Toulouse founded several wineries because they wanted their Gaillac wines. And it turns out, I didn't know, that during the 1200s and 1300s, and basically into the beginning of the 1400s, it was the center of gourmet activity. Mm. And so one of the reasons we have so many beautiful pigeon towers... Pigeon. Pigeon, town. pigeon, pigeon. Yeah, I'm spitting yeah, for, into for, the microphone. For, uh, for like pigeons. Uh, pigeons that carry messages and things the like pigeon that? Pigeon towers for pigeons so that they can poop. The reason where that the southwest and the region between Toulouse and Gaillac, for instance, if you drive on the old country roads, and we saw three beautiful ones on Sunday, is these gorgeous old medieval pigeon towers. Most of them have been restored. Yeah, we have one like uh, a few hundred, a couple of kilometers from where I live. Yeah. It's very old, but it's it's mostly broken down. It's mostly broken down. Well, a lot of them, what they've been doing is, of course, in the last 50 years, is they've been renovating them and turning them into either uh, like bed and breakfast type places, you know, if you want to, you can sleep in a vision tower, uh, or just renovating because they're, uh, from a uh, historical point of view, absolutely beautiful and very specific to this area of France. So what was that bit about? Okay, so let me explain. So the reason why they're there is because the Counts of Toulouse and then the King of France said in a charter, in papers that still exist, that they wanted to make sure that the Gaillac wines were of the highest quality. This is why I found so fascinating. These papers still exist. And therefore, they couldn't use anything as manure. They had to use only pigeon poop. Because pigeon poop, I don't know what other word to use. There is a nice word in French, but I don't know. Excrements. No, there's even a nicer word. Dejections. Something else. No, it's not that. that, But but it turns out that... uh, I know a few in French, but it won't help. It turns out that it is the best fertilizer for the land also without leaving any specific odors or bad acidic taste in the soil and so it was necessary to use that to fertilize the vineyards oh. and only that and only that I see. so the people who were rich peasants or who were the lords who rented out their land what they did was they made it a law that they could only use this pigeon poop, and therefore these pigeon towers were built everywhere, which is why you have, either, there are books where you can see the different varieties of the styles of them. They're absolutely gorgeous. And this was so that there would be, and it's written specifically in this charter, only of the highest quality grapes and soil to produce the best wines in the Gaillac area. Mm. Well, there you go. And there you go. Now we know. <laughs> and there, And this lasted until... The end of the basically the beginning of the 1600s, mm. and this is when the domination of Aquitaine and Bordeaux, and also the fights between the English and the French, and then the the the, the war between the Protestants and the Catholics. We have a period of time where all kinds of things interfere with the continuation of this quality of the wine, and so up until the 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 revolution, basically you have. Uh, people start forgetting about the Gaia wines outside of the region. Mm. And this continues even right after the revolution. And the 
it's in the beginning of the 19th century that people start replanting the grapes to make a good wine again, mm. having discovered all of these uh, old varieties of grapes. And then unfortunately, what happens is the same thing that has happened pretty much everywhere in France, which is the phylloxia. Oh, yes. So that by the time you get to the middle of the 19th century, you have uh, this disease uh, which affects all of the vineyards completely everywhere. So the second half of the 19th century, uh, the Bordeaux grape vines are all destroyed. In fact, mm. the ones that there are now are the great-grandchildren of the ones that were taken from there to California and brought back again, right. the cuttings that were brought back. And the Gaillac wine basically disappears. Mm. And it is not brought back again. Obviously, when I say disappears, I mean commercially disappears. Right, right. You always had the people that had some always, at yeah. home. Yeah. And, and they kept these old varieties of grapes, which it turns out, of course, from an, uh, a botanical point of view, were the best suited for the land that they were in. Well, right. that's usually how it works. Right. It's like the ones that keep producing or keep reproducing, growing and so forth, are just happy there. They're just happy there. Yeah. So what happened was uh, that by the time we get to the 20th century, uh, there is a push to reestablish the wine area and the Gayak area. Once the trains come in, they can export again because we have a period of time where not only was it for financial reasons, but because of the disease. And then there was the problem with the boats no longer being used on the river. So once there is the And there's train, also kind of a glut of wine in France. And, and there's a glut of wine. There's so much wine in France that, you know... Uh, Nobody's desperate for more wine. Really. And what's interesting <laughs> is that there is a claim, and of course there's no way of proving it, that they were the first ones to produce what would be an, a champagne-like wine. Oh. Before champagne. Hmm. So the story is that the monks who eventually created the champagne, we once did a, a podcast about the monks and the champagne. Yeah. They came down, they, they went to uh, Limou, where there was already a mousseau. Uh, there was a, you know, a, a blanquette. A blanquette. But they also used uh, and tasted the, the mousseau that was in Gaillac. Hmm. So who knows which is the best, but they were already producing something like that. And I have to say, I tasted one on Sunday and it was very delicious. Mm. It was very nice. It was very nice. It's, it's very fun when you get to go to these places and try the local wines. Sometimes you're very happily surprised. Very, yes. very. <laughs> yes, you are. I mean, so, so basically what happened was this. There was a, um, a revival of the Gaillac wine industry in the 20th century. Once they got past the phylloxeria and there was another, uh, there was a, a, another disease that was a, attacking some of the grapevines, what they decided to do very wisely was go back to the varieties of grapes that were endemic to the area they figured would be more rustic, would, would survive better, and it, yeah. was a, it was the case. So it turns out that it is one of the first AOCs of all the wines in all of France. Oh, wow. And it was the whites, not the reds. Mm. In 1938, hmm. they were given the very first AOC. Wow. And that is because of the quality of the white wines, which to this day I, I happen to love. I mean, they're very distinctive. And see, that's, I mean, if you say Gaillac wines, I think of a red. You think of a red. And yeah. I think of the white. And and, huh. and I think of the whites. And then they have the, the invention of this, what they call perlé, which is not a bubbly but slightly slightly effervescent yeah very, and that was very. created in 1957 mm. and then in 1970 the reds were given an aoc so altogether gaiac is one of the most ancient wine producing areas and then because it had lost its reputation as an excellent quality wine what has happened is that in the last 20 25 years that has changed because it's lots of small producers and they take very good care. They're, they're proportionally more, uh, um, it's either organic or raisonné in the Gaillac area, mm -hmm. which means they use less um, toxic, el I'm, I'm, I'm losing my, my language here. Yeah, yeah, agriculture raisonné. Right. Agriculture raisonné. Uh, agriculture raisonné means you're not completely... Um, 
pesticide free, free but you use less but you use as little as possible exactly you try other things first exactly yeah so now this is the thing in the Gayak area there are reds there are whites and there are also some rosés although i would say that personally i think mostly that it's of when i think of Gayak wines i think mostly of reds and whites i'm not about yeah. you I, I don't think mostly of rosés when i think <sighs> about Gayak no. wines I don't know that I've bought rosé from Gaillac. No, I don't know if I have. Not. It's it's an area that is large. The producing of Gaillac wines covers a fairly large territory. And the road that I just want to mention that we took on Sunday is the left bank, which is basically the southern side of the Tarn River. And uh, it is where more of the reds are produced as opposed to the whites. It has to do with the soil. It has to do with things that are very technical that I just was reading about. I'm not going to even go into because I'm not sure I even completely understand it. Mm. But it produces these very beautiful, robust, relatively spicy, but not heavy red wines. Mm. And they are absolutely delicious. Mm. And there are many small producers. So the, the Gayak area, like the Burgundy area, is an area of many small plots with lots of chateaus. And what we did was we took this one road, which is the Departmental 18, which is a nice, lovely little country road. And we started out in the small town of Ravastance, which is 34 kilometers north of Toulouse, so it's not very far. And we took this road and went through the area where you are driving basically through uh, vineyards to your left and... Uh, bit of the valley to your right and you look up to the hills and you can see and there are signs and it says this is part of the the Gayak wine road mm. and there are four different chateaus along this road mm. and basically most of them are open to the public now in the winter it's usually either by appointment or weekends it's in the summertime and in the warm months that they're open on a regular basis. I went online yesterday because I wanted to make sure. And of the five that are mentioned that we passed that are in this just one small section, because it's not even getting to the town of Gayak, uh, there's only one that is not generally open to the public. You have to call and ask for an appointment to go in and visit them. But this is just a small section of the Gayak Are area. you going to tell us the names of yes, these? Yes, I am going to tell you the names. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so... <laughs> You have uh, basically, I'm um, starting f by leaving the town of Rabastance, and then mm -hmm. I'm just going to mention a little about these two places where we started and where we ended. You have the Domaine de Mazou, M A Z O U. M A Z O U, yes. You have the Domaine Sarabelle, Sarabelle with two R's, like so Sarah and Belle, but with two R's. Yeah. You have uh, the Ma de Rioux, R I O U. R I O U, yeah. I'm 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 jotting it down so I can put it in the show notes. You have uh uh the um it's not a domain. It's called Michel Isali, I S S A L Y, I S S A L Y Y. Okay. And the one that I love that I, this time we revisited because it's more than just a place that produces wine, and that is the Chateau de Source, S A U R S. Yeah. And what makes this particular place special, and it's a, all of these are along the D18, uh, yeah. which circles around, by the way. I mean, it's a kind of circuitous route, but it's lovely driving, countryside driving. It's really very pleasant. And, or uh, cycling. And, and cycling. And I happen to love landscape that has vineyards. It's just one of my favorite things. It just makes my heart palpitate. You know, I just love it. Yeah. Um, but the Chateau de Source is really special because it is a real chateau. Uh, the designation of Domaine or Chateau often means, when we're talking about wine, that it's a place that grows wine. But in this case, it is a real authentic old chateau. Mm -hmm. The building that is there actually was rebuilt on top of a 15th century chateau. Mm. And it has been, uh, it is the oldest producing chateau in the Gaillac area. It traces its uh, history as a wine producing chateau back to the 1400s. Mm, okay. And it is open to the public because it's a huge domain. Uh, in the winter, it's only open Thursdays and then on the weekends, but it is magnificent. There's a huge uh, Italianate garden. Uh, there's a, a rose garden. Uh, there are walks. There's sculpture everywhere. You called it an Italian Italianate. 
Italianate. Yeah. Which means basically it was designed in the style of an Italian garden, but it's not Italian. I mean, so it's, it's wanna be Italian. It's a wanna be Italian, yeah. But Italian it sounds better. Uh, Italian is <laughs> well. It's kind of nice, you know. Fountains and flowers and you know, crazy sculptures and things like that, you know. And of course they have a, a place where you can taste the wines. Again, uh, in the winter I was just there this Sunday, which of course is because it was open for the weekend for this special weekend. Uh, but normally I asked the, the Chatelaine. So uh, <laughs> you want me to mention this? Uh, a yeah. Chatelaine is uh, basically a term that comes from the feudal times, mm-hmm. <clears throat> from the Middle Ages, and it means the lady as opposed to the lord. Yeah. Le uh, Chatelain. The Chatelain. La Chatelaine. And the Chatelaine. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, uh, we were greeted, there were there's a young woman that was also, she's the young woman is the one that served me a little tasting of two wines, but uh, the Chatelaine was there. And partly that was because of the COVID. So there are very few people presenting themselves to the public these days. Uh, but uh, I, I know a bit of the history of this family. It's a family that has also produced uh, Annie's favorite restaurant. Uh, L'entrecote. L'entrecote. Uh, <laughs> they are the ones who invented the, the concept of this restaurant. And it's these wines from the Chateau de Source that are used in the Entrecote restaurants everywhere in France. But uh, she was... Did you give you a choice of uh, Gaillac or Bordeaux? Do they give you a choice of Bordeaux? I think you can get yeah. a Bordeaux at L'entrecote, yeah. Mm. Check again. I'm not sure. No. Maybe. Uh, I'll, I'll go again yeah. soon. The wines soon, are good soon. anyway, whatever. Right now, it's no, even used in their sauces. Right now, I'm not going to any restaurant. No, uh uh-uh. uh. But, but if you want to have an idea of what it means to be in the presence of a, a Chatelaine, uh, this was a moment. My husband wasn't with me. I went inside to do the tasting by myself. He was still wandering around taking pictures. Um, uh, it, it, the, the term in French is Uten. Ah. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure exactly. It's how not old was this person? In her fifties, she was in her fifties. Mm. Yeah, um, it it is. It's a kind of hard to describe because it's not just the idea of being a little bit snobbish. It's more than that. It's like I have a position in society that is higher up than yours, which is what the word is from because the word "uten" comes from the word "o." Oh. H a u t. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I am the cat's meow. I am. I am the. She was the person who has this land and this chateau. But aside from that, which it amused me enormously because I couldn't care less. Uh, but uh, <laughs> What? You weren't pr- appropriately impressed? Uh, no, I was not appropriately <laughs> impressed. Uh, but uh, the wines there are absolutely delicious. And it's also a place that is wonderful to visit because it has a view o- down to the valley of the Tarn River and up the other side. And the lands are gorgeous there and it's filled with sculpture. So it's a lovely place on a day that it is open to the public to visit. But besides that, when you do this, just this section, and you visit, you can visit these other places as well, obviously. You can also do what we did, which is you can stop in one of uh, several little towns that are absolutely lovely. This is an area that has lots of little towns that are red brick, like Toulouse, like Albi. Mm-hmm. And the, we started in a, a small, these are towns, that is, they're all about five, 6,000 people. So it's not quite a, it's not a village, it's, it's a small town. Yeah. And we started by going through the town of Rabastance, yep. uh, which is right on the Tarn River, mm-hmm. and which I strongly recommend as a place to visit either uh, before or after, as either a starting point or as an ending point. Mm-hmm. You can actually go as far as Gaillac and work your way back to Rabastance, or you can get off the auto route at Rabastance and then work your way up, up on the D80, which, which is what we did. And it's... a place that is fascinating because it's part of it is is built high up on the cliffs right above the Tarn River and it has one of the most beautiful old medieval sections of any small city you will find in the southwest of France not very big but absolutely lovely with old, old, old houses and very well taken care of and gardens and flowers everywhere. And it is really charming and very astonishing to see because it is so high up on the banks of the river. And there's a church there, uh, Notre Dame de Bourg. De Bourg. Bourg, B-O-U-R-G. Yeah. Which has a facade that is 
designated uh, as a World UNESCO Heritage Site because the town of Rabastance, which was very affluent because of the wine starting in the early Middle Ages, then became a stop on the uh, Road de Compostelle. Ah, okay. And so it, it was very affluent all through the Middle Ages. Is it still on the route? It is still one of the roads okay. to, to, to... You can go from there directly to Moissac. You don't have to go okay. down to, to Toulouse. You can go uh, southwest and go to Moissac from there. It's equidistant. Rabastance is equidistant between Montauban and Toulouse. Okay. It's really tw- 35 kilometers from both, really. Stuck it's right. got to be pretty close to my house. <laughs> yeah, I'm north of actually. Toulouse. <laughs> right. And, and it's, it's charming. It's absolutely charming. It, 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 it seduced me. <laughs> this mm-hmm. is very, uh, mm-hmm. It has a funny, funky little museum costs, I think, four or five euros to go in. That's a combination of archaeology, has some of the uh, Roman runes because it used to be a Roman villa before it became whatever it became afterwards, which was a walled uh, city in the Middle Ages. It has a section that's archaeological. It has a section that's about the, the winemaking. It has a section about crafts. It has a section about painting. It's, it's one of those little surprises. Some in, of everything. It's a little bit some of everything. The town also has an absolutely magnificent, wonderful bakery. I don't remember the name of it, but oh my God, I was just like, I bought two pastries there and I went, oh yes, I think I'm moving to Rabastance, you know, <laughs> forget the wine. Uh, and from there, you can go and take the D18 and do exactly what we did, which is go to visit all these things and end up, because they're all technically closer to uh, this other town called lille sur town which is now written L I S L E, but used to have an apostrophe L right. apostrophe. It's not because it's an island, but because the curve in the river made the people there think of it as being like on an island. It's just kind of like a little teeny bend in the Tarn River, and mm-hmm. so it, it's they decided to call it that. It's from the old uh, Occitan uh, term for for an island, mm-hmm. and Lille Sultan is also Lille Sultan is beautiful. Unlike being high up on on the cliff side of the tarn, though, it is lower down, but it is a bastide, and it is a perfect example of a medieval town built in the second half of the 1200s from scratch on a perfect grid system. It is one of those villages, uh, again, it's not really a village because it has um, almost 5,000 people, and yeah. more and more people are leaving Toulouse and moving to places like Lille Sultan and Rabat Stans and commuting back and forth. Uh, and it's got the, one of the most beautiful uh, sections of old houses from the time of the Bastides, that is the Middle Ages, and a huge square that's one of the biggest squares, open squares, with this gorgeous carved fountain in the middle and arcades all around it. And it happens that we were there on Sunday, and Sunday is their market day. Mm. So it was fun because uh, even though, of course, markets now don't have quite the same things that they had before, um, you still get an idea of what this square was built for from the very Mm -hmm. beginning. And it has restaurants and it has some cafes, just so does Ravistance, by the way. But uh, it's very beautiful. And because everything is on a grid, you can walk around. The church is eccentric to the square. It's very much off to the side. You don't see it at all. But you can go and walk a few blocks, and you see this is something that's very typical of the area. These are houses called pontet, P-O-N-T-E-T, and it's houses on these narrow medieval streets that have a room on the first floor above the ground floor that connect. So literally, it's like a going. you can go from one side of the street to the other, through the houses mm. and walk underneath it on the street. Oh, so there's like a bridge on the it's, first level? It, except that it's actually a room closed in as part of the building from one side to the other. And these mm. are called pontets. And it was very typical of the bastides that were built on flat land so that they could do this and add extra space. And then sometimes people would build it with the uh, permission of the people on the other side because they didn't necessarily belong to the same person on the two sides of the street, Mm -hmm. but they would get permission to build the piece across. It's very strange. Now some of them are connecting from one side to the other. So you Mm -hmm. can actually have a house that goes from one side of the street to the other and walk underneath it. And it's fascinating. (laughs) It's absolutely fascinating. I hope you took some photos. I don't have any photos of that. I have them from a book that I will will send you because I have lots of pictures of it. Yeah, but I can't use photos from a book. I didn't take the photo. (laughs) 
<laughs> I have nothing to say. I have the, no. I took a. I have pictures from from ages ago of the of the square and the fountain though that mm-hmm. I can, that I will send. You. I look, I look. But, but anyway, I uh, might have to go. And this oh, is the Ilshotan. Oh yes, well, <laughs> I, I will I will I will hitch a ride again with you to go back because I just love it up there. Um, and and it's it's charming, absolutely charming. There's uh, uh, a couple of restaurants there. There's this very funky. I really mean funky. Uh, Museum of Chocolate. Mm. That is filled with just sculptures, and what a waste of chocolate, as far as I'm concerned, you know. Um, but but both so they of, made they, they, sculptures out of chocolate. Yeah, and then they do sell some chocolate. But the, what's fascinating is that you sound underwhelmed. By I'm that under, one. I'm totally underwhelmed. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I'm totally yeah. underwhelmed. Uh, but again, there's also a tiny little museum that has some art. I mean, both of these towns, Rabastans and Le Sultan, are very dynamic. And have an incoming population, so it's not just like old people. It's like a very mixed population in terms of age, and there, because of that, there's there's a lot of activity in both mm-hmm. of them, and it makes them fun as places to visit. Yeah, not, and also because they're very beautiful and typical of very old things in the area. Now, and if you don't want to even do those, and if you just want to do the 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 wine road or this part of the wine road, you can get off at Rapid Dance, do it, and then wind up going straight to Gayak because there's indications how to get there. And Gayak, which is a city, it's a small city, but it's a city. Yeah. It's true. It's not a place that I particularly like. I don't think it's particularly pretty. Um, mm-hmm. It's a, uh, it's, it's coming up, but it used to be kind of decrepit, but mm. Uh, it is the center of the distribution of the wine. There are three major cooperatives for Gayak wine besides all the little domains and the chateaus. And they have an outlet in the city of Gayak in this building that was part of this Benedictine Abbey called the Abbey of Saint Michel that is now the major cave for the tasting and learning about the production of the Gayak wines. Mm. And it's a place that is visitable all the time, all year long. So that's, it's, it's in this abbey. It's in, it's actually in the abbey, which is built on the river. And the abbey no longer, of course, functions as an abbey, but was taken over and has just been recently renovated so that now they even have a couple of rooms where they explain the geological foundation for why the wines are produced here. And what's it called? It's the Abbey of Saint-Michel. And okay. it's just the cave. It's the cave of the Abbey of Saint-Michel. And they offer tastings of many of the producers because I don't know if this is honestly, I have no idea how this works in other areas like in Burgundy, uh, which is filled with small producers as well. But one of the things that's very interesting about Gayak is there are many, many, many small producers of wine. Mm. And some of them choose to stay separate and sell their wines as the chateau or the domain of but a lot of them put their wines together because there are three main cooperatives. One is in Rabastance. One is called Tiku, and you and I know that. Uh, one is the Oval Valley, which is this huge bat- building that is now along the Otter route between here and Albi. And these are not bad wines, even though these are mixed with the different producers of right. wine. And I, they're cooperative kind of wines. They're cooperative wines. But I think, I'm not sure, I would say that probably one of the reasons is that they don't produce... These are producers who don't produce enough individually to make enough wine of them just by themselves. Mm-hmm. So they pool their wines together. But the reason why is because they're all still using these very famous varieties of grapes that grapes that exist nowhere else. You didn't tell us the names of the yes, grapes. Yes, and, and I was just realizing yeah. that. So now I have to look. I, now, two of them, one of them that's very famous, and I know this from the very first time I went there because I remember my first visit to this area and I had to have the person explain this to me three times. In French, this is for white wines, okay? The wine that is, there are two that are specific to the Gaillac area. One is called Loin de l'Oeil. Loin de l'Oeil. Yep. Comme loin de l'oeil, which is the French version of what it was in Occitan, which don't ask me. It was, you know, it's, it's, it's from an old, old, old version that got turned into the French loin de l'oeil because apparently that is really what it meant in, in Occitan, Gaillacois, whatever, you know. Uh, and, it's, and today it means f- far from the eye. Far from the eye. And it's the and that and Mozac M A U Z A C M A U Z A C and that's both whites. Those are whites, and these are two that are specific 
only to the Gaillac area. Hmm. And then there are two others. One is Muscadel, which is mostly used in this area, but you can find somewhere else. And then they sometimes... Is that do, white too? This is still white. Yeah. And then sometimes a teeny little bit of Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. But if you want a real Gaillac, it's got to have Mozac and Loin de l'Oeil. And it gives it this taste that's very crisp and fresh and pear-like. And I will stop with my wine nonsense there. <laughs> um, and it's why one of the reasons I love them. And for the reds, the two that are the most important are the Duras, like in Marguerite. Oh, yeah. And it has nothing to do with the town, but this is the grape that is from this area around okay. the Gaillac, and Brocol, B-R-A-U-C-O-L. B-R-A-U-C-O-L, Brocol, yes. Brocol. Brocol. And then they do add sometimes some Syrah, which we know about. And uh, another one that I uh, is used very little because I was looking at the proportions called Servadou Noir. But I really, it's very small, like 3 4% of the production, I mean, of the mm. mix is, is this particular yeah. grape. Yeah. Uh, and these grape varieties are uh, specifically the ones that obviously, like not the Syrah, but these others are only produced and used in the Gaillac area mm. and nowhere else. Mm. And the bottle of uh, champagne-like wine I got the other day was 100% Duras. It was fascinating. I mean, I'm, you know, I don't know why. I'm and fascinated it by this. Good. And it, it was delicious. Huh. And it was, it was light and crisp and bubbly. Hmm. And I bought a bottle of white. So, 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 wait, wait, wait. You said that this Duras is a red wine. It's, it's a red wine, but it was a, I got a, um, a, a, a rosé champagne type wine. Ah, ah, okay. So it's a pink champagne. This was a pink champagne. But the, the bottle of white I got was mostly Mosaic and Loin de l'Oeil. Okay. And Interesting. And it will put me in Loin de l'Oeil when I drink it. <laughs> <laughs> so probably, probably. You never drink that much. <laughs> no, I never drink that much. No. Uh, but it happens that uh, for, for quite a few years now, uh, when I've taken people around visiting either in Toulouse or in the area, and they ask me to give suggestions about wines, I always talk about Gaillac wines for two reasons. One, because I happen to really like them, mm -hmm. and they're not everybody's taste, I have to say, but sure. I really do like Nothing them. Nothing is. And they are dry and crisp, and they have reds and whites, but also because a very good bottle of Gaillac is much less money than trying to get a very good bottle of a Bordeaux or a Burgundy. Yeah. You spend 12, 14 euros, and you're a top... Yeah, uh, really. Those are the good ones. It's a, it's a really, really good wine. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and by the time, I mean, if some of them get exported to the U.S., which I'm not even sure if they are. I have no idea. By the time they get to you in the U.S. or Canada, it's going to be at least twice that much. Exactly. Maybe three times that much. Yeah. Because I, they are unusual. They're very you know. unusual. And their production, although it has uh, increased enormously, is certainly nothing like yeah. the, the big, big major, you know, other wine producing areas. Yeah. Yeah. But I love their wines. And it's a very lovely area. It's, it's hilly, but it's, um, it, it's a combination of kind of like a landscape that's kind of Mediterranean, but not completely Mediterranean. And I've just talked about the southern part of the Gaillac region because If you go north of the city of Gaillac, then you get into steeper land. And strangely enough, that is where more of the whites are produced. Mm. And that takes you to a place we've talked about before, and that is Courts or Ciel and other places like that. And it's much higher up, and it's a little further north. Mm. But we're not going to talk about that not part today, today. Not today. No. Are you ready for some Blanquette de, Lim uh, Blanquette de Vaux? I'm Sorry. Lucky, but <laughs> not yes. Limoux, no. No, not the Limoux. Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready, dear. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm testing my recipe for Blanquette de Vaux uh, on Elise today. So, and to do that I used the white from the Seven. From the Seven? Yes. Oh. It was very inexpensive. And I figured since I'm going to cook with it, eh, I don't yeah. need to spend a fortune. Well, I we'll agree see. with you. We'll, we'll see. see. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Elise. You are quite welcome. Au revoir. Bye. Hello, everyone. This is Elise. I would like to just give a shout out to two new patrons 
for my Patreon page, which is called Elise's Corner. And so thank you so very much, Jeff, for your wonderful contribution, and also to Dr. Green Chicken. Thank you so much. I would love to find out what your real name is, if you would be so kind. Um, I'll be sending each of you a message, uh, a personalized message, in a, a few minutes. I just would like to remind everybody that being a patron warms my heart, and it's a great way to show your support for the work that I do with Annie on the podcast. And if you would be interested in becoming a patron, just go to patreon.com forward slash Elise Art, that is E-L-Y-S-A-R-T, and you will find my page, which is called Elise's Corner. I hope you're all well out there, and I'll be getting back to you soon. Have a wonderful holiday. Thank you. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing so, and you can see them all at patreon.com forward slash join us. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Join us, no spaces or dashes. Thank you, all of you, for supporting the show. Some of you, for many years now, you are fantastic. And a shout out this week to new patrons, Jay Hardcastle, Neil Fujisher. Oof. Fuji Shiga? Shiji? Sh- Ooh, this is this one's hard. Fuji Shiga. That's I'll say it that way. <laughs> and Mary Smith, thank you so much for becoming patrons and becoming part of the team. I made a lot of progress on my Mare virtual tours that I'll make available for free for my patrons very soon. And you know what I love about this version of the tour? I can stop and tell you all of the things that I'm dying to share with you. With VoiceMap, I had time constraints because things are really close together. So you can't really talk and talk and talk. And I don't want to keep you standing anywhere too long. And I didn't want to talk your ears off either. But... As long as I keep it reasonably brief, virtual tours allow me to share a lot more. So I'm loving it. I want to thank you for helping me make a fabulous list of unique gifts for Francophiles. They are at, can you guess? Joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique. And I'll show you uh, favorite products on Amazon. And I love to see what you cook from uh, Join Us at the Table. Many of you are sporting beautiful classic French foods in gorgeous tableware. Keep sharing your photos. It makes me very happy to see your creations. And I've now received a copy of Join Us at the Table in every print format, paperback, hardback, and coil bound. The one I think I will refer to the most is probably to be the coil bound because it's so handy, but they're all well made. The photos look great. The paper quality is excellent. I lucked out because for a first book, it worked out. (laughs) There was some faith involved in this, I must admit, and it worked out. For my personal update this week, uh, we've decided we need to change our sofas. So we're going to have to go test some out. It makes me a little nervous because I go out so little. But, you know, we can try sofas with masks on. So hopefully we've decided to go ahead with it. Uh, Sofas do get a beating with um, kids. Well, our daughter, we've had them a long time. So our daughter was young when we got them. And dogs, obviously, we've had dogs the whole time. So it's going to be fun to uh, to shop for new sofas. Swiffer, the dog is going back to his owner tomorrow. She's a student in Wales and she's coming home for the holidays. She will try to take him back with her when she goes back. But if you think getting on an airplane is complicated for humans these days, try taking a dog with you. So we'll see uh, if she manages. I'm preparing some plans for our Christmas Eve and Christmas Day dinners. I thought we would spend it with family, but that that might not come true. We're we're discussing, let's put it this way. The problem is that some of us are really worried about COVID. That would be me and my husband and the others not at all. And and this is a problem. I mean, and some in between, obviously. Uh, So either way, We'll have a lovely dinner. This year, I'm planning on oysters on the half shell, uh, which I love. And I, 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 
I can open them very easily. And something very, very French called coquille de Saint-Jacques. Uh, so that these are scallops. In a, they're presented in a beautiful big shell and with a creamy sauce. It's beautiful. And when you make them from scratch, they're really good. Uh, and I, But I will buy my bûche de Noël. So that's the Yule log cake. Uh, I'll buy it frozen because that's my favorite. <laughs> French people don't make bûche de Noël very much at home because it's so much work and we can buy it anywhere really um, I've ordered uh, Christmas chocolates of all sorts and now if we're not going to be hanging out with family I have to find something fun and especially different to do that day I'm, I'm thinking maybe we'll make bagels with my daughter um, I don't know We've, I've never tried sounds like a fun challenge anyway we'll, we'll see you know Christmas movies play video games whatever well we'll figure something out I hope the pandemic is not throwing too many difficulties into your holiday plans. I mean, I hope so, but I don't dare hope at the same time, because I know it's really complicated for everyone. They've changed the rules of confinement again in France, and that starts today, Saturday. Now, we don't have to do the permission slips anymore unless we're out of n at night, and we can go anywhere we want in France so long as it's not at night. So we have a curfew starting at 8 p.m. and uh, lasting until 6 a.m., um, but there won't be a curfew on December 24th, but, and this is the big deal, a curfew will be in place for New Year's Eve. And they will, they have announced that it will be enforced. So <sighs> no restaurants, no plays, no cinemas, no fun, no parties, no street anything. Uh, I hate this pandemic. But I know there are a lot of people who are going to be in trouble for having uh, parties that they shouldn't be having. And I know why they must stop these parties. The government is just being responsible. But I accept that, you know, I'm, I'm totally with them. But I, I hate it. I hate it. And Sanofi Pasteur has announced that they don't think they'll have a vaccine until December 2021. So if you were holding your breath for a French vaccine, I'm sorry to tell you that it's not going to happen. I think they will produce a great vaccine, but it's going to be for the long term. They were not ready for this urgent need. But hey, I can't complain. I can continue to do my work. I have a lot of great projects that are moving along well. I'm I'm fine, but it sucks for most people and I realize that and I'm and I'm sorry. Stay safe, hang in there. It feels like this year was as long as a decade, but it will end sooner or later. And it would be awful to have been so cautious this whole time just to blow it now. So stay put and be patient. If you enjoy the show, introduce a friend to the podcast and show them how to listen. We're on the radio.com mobile app, as well as all podcast apps, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, Pandora. And of course, you can also listen on Join us in France.com next week on the podcast, an episode about the real story of Christmas as far as French people are concerned. And as you know, French people are always right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. I'm planning a lot of uh, fun new episodes. Thank you to all of you who offered to do episodes with me. Thank you for listening. And I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2020 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.